In his article on Game Informer, Ben Reeves explained that video games fulfill a set of needs. The first is the need for competence. We seek out control and wish to feel mastery over a situation. The second is the desire for independence, to have control over our actions. The developers of Breath of the Wild created a world in which the player does indeed have full control. Nothing tells them what to do or where to go, and there are hundreds of ways to approach any given problem. More control means that you can apply your imagination to your movement. It raises the ceiling of what is possible. So why then, do so many games dedicate an entire world towards taking that control away? The reason I say that, and why I hate Ice Age, is because you have a different set of control than what you're used to. And the same case of trying to get used to Luigi U compared to Mario U. But that on top of the ice is still frustrating, and while it is technically the proper difficulty, it's still frustrating as all hell. When you get used to one specific thing and then suddenly it changes it up, then you have to readjust. That's the thing. Why do ice worlds exist? The reason is simple. It adds difficulty. But does that justify it? Well, not exactly. If it did, then so too would this be justified. Ice levels are almost as bad as water levels. Oh, that is exactly why. Add difficulty while maintaining fairness. That sounds like a simple task, as though making an entertaining level is as easy as following a recipe. But if you follow a recipe, you don't understand what spices are responsible for what flavors. You don't know why you're supposed to use them, they're just in the recipe. Sure, if you experiment, there are definitely going to be some meals that people spit out. But after a few failures, you understand what everything does, and people start asking for more. When you follow a recipe, you make the new Super Mario Bros. series. But when you experiment and learn how to make something from scratch, you make Donkey Kong Country 2. Last episode, I said that Ice Worlds are a litmus test that offer insight into the capabilities of the devs. Tell me, in which of these examples does it show that the developers understand the ingredients of their craft? I don't even think I need to tell you which of these examples is which. It's obvious. Just as it was obvious to you as I played through this world that the devs understood their ingredients. There are two main approaches towards making ice worlds. The first is the mechanical approach, where the main features of the environment are slippery surfaces, slow movement in snow, a time limit before you freeze, death water, ice blockades, and enemies that freeze you. The aim of the mechanical approach is to add difficulty through realism. Most of these mechanics are properties found in real-life tundra. The world is unforgiving, difficult to traverse, and generally inhospitable. The other is the aesthetic approach, where the main features are strong visual themes of serenity, comfort, or holiday cheer, gorgeous vistas, occasional low visibility, and lower difficulty. This approach plays on the feelings that snow normally evokes in a person. It satisfies our innate desire for warmth and comfort, and emulates the serenity that a thick blanket of snow creates. The music, more so than ever, is looking for an emotional response from the player. This isn't black and white. Very few games follow one approach exclusively. This environment is too beautiful to not replicate, and too harsh to not emulate. However, it is always clear what the aim was, which brings us to Pac-Man World 2. Obviously, this is the mechanical approach. The developers ran with a snow day sledding and snowball fight theme, with the music sounding adventurous and full of glee. We start off with Ice River Run, which is dense with traditional slippery surfaces. That's at first glance, but a closer look reveals that those ice physics are almost completely avoidable. If you platform well, then the ice can be avoided. They're a punishment for complacent jumps and sloppy platforming. Notice that these safe havens also protect the players from rev rams. The game is telling you to be intentional with your movement. Players who take this hint will also figure out how to skip entire segments of the level, or find secrets well off the beaten path. Not enough games make use of avalanches as a hazard. It's an interesting set piece that, unfortunately, in this implementation, leads to a lot of deaths and the need for memorization. I'm not saying that this can't be done on the first try, but some of the hazards feel unfair. Did you follow this visual cue that was well established in multiple parts of the level? <laughs> Quaked! 
While I do have some friction with the implementation of this level, I also respect it for some of its finer points. For one, the patches of the ice reinforce the message that the player needs to be intentional with their movement. They must commit to a direction knowing that they won't be able to change course. It also makes use of these icy gusts as a hazard in the second act, and a useful boost in the final. The thrill of skipping so much of the level with these boisterous breezes makes one want to play the level again and again. Sure, they do have an equal chance of killing you, but who is going to complain when stuff like this happens? Think back to your childhood, of that time where you ran across a frozen pothole and nearly broke your tailbone. No one complained about ice physics as a kid, and why is that? Well, it's because we have skates. Ice takes away friction, so why are we being asked to play ice levels at this pace? Take away the annoying jumps, increase the speed, and let the player soar. When done correctly, Ice Worlds act as a portfolio of the developer, a proclamation that they understand the components of their craft and how to use them to their fullest. Up until I started to analyze game design, I believed that the aesthetic approach was the only way to make an enjoyable ice level. Pac-Man World 2 showed me that that's not the case. The mechanical approach does not have to be an obligatory and rage-inducing removal of control. Despite their temperature, ice levels can be fluid. They equip the player with the grace of a figure skater, giving them equal measures of speed and control. And in spite of their harshness, ice levels can be enchanting. They comfort the player with their silence and enrapture them with their serenity. A canvas response is a reflection of its artist. With intent and understanding, the canvas reflects the artist's vision. But with complacency and ignorance, the canvas reflects the artist's frustration. This has been my introspective on ice levels in video games. Thank you for watching.